right, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us um, for tonight's second event, um, our lecture series with the State and Slow Food Columbus. Um, my name is Mark Anthony Arsenio, and I am the um, Chair of Special Events and Programming for Food Columbus, as well as the lecture series team leader for Ohio State APOP. Bringing up to right now our PowerPoint presentation. Um, today, I'm, I'm really excited on our panel, um, Jenny Brittenbauer of Jenny's Splendid Ice Cream, uh, Minister Aaron Hopkins and Antoinette Hopkins of Southside Family Farms, and Dr. Barbara Piperata from the Department of Anthropology at The Ohio State University. Um, as you can tell right now, this event is going to be recorded for folks to take a look at after the event and to enjoy and relive tonight's experience. Um, for those who are unfamiliar with Zoom, um, there should be the ability to read our live captioning. Um, this is going to be using Zoom's AI technology, so I apologize in advance if some of the words just don't seem to work or aren't exactly mirroring what we're saying. I promise we'll go back in and clarify those captions as we post it up to YouTube um, later. As I mentioned at the start, this is co-hosted by Ohio State APOP, so I just wanted to take a moment to remind everyone um, what APOP is all about. As the name suggests, we're trying to um, create this outreach effort um, to introduce anthropology to folks outside of Smith Lab where our department is housed. Um, in addition, we also have a podcast series that is um, up and running. Um, so you can see on the screen QR codes for Dr. Anna Willow, who happens to be my advisor, and myself. Um, we're episodes three and four of the series um, that has been released since our last episode. Um, we also have Slow Food Columbus, and I'm going to unmute um, Katie Hart, who's going to be, I'm really excited about this, who's going to be talking to us about the um, first person event that we are planning with Slow Food Columbus. Um, so Katie, go ahead and take it away. Hi, good evening. Um, we are very excited to announce our first in-person social event of 2021. Um, we're excited for this for many reasons. One being that we get to actually get together and see each other face to face and break bread together. Um, we all know the power and the beauty behind that. Of course, we will be adhering to COVID guidelines uh, to keep everyone safe. Another reason that we're very excited for this event is actually gonna be one of three um, in-person um, in events that we've created around what we're calling the producers panel. Basically, we're inviting local food advocates to get together and discuss this redefining local. Local has been a hot topic, a big topic for a long time. So we wanna make sure that we're staying current and relevant in our client and discussing that. So, and we also get to go to Cleaver and Grandview. So it's a newer restaurant to the Columbus area. So we'll get to experience um, Cleaver. We'll get to support a local business, enjoy some local food. We have a couple of different ticket options. So one would be the in-person ticket options uh, for $25, which includes getting to the event. We'll also have a social time where um, libations and cash bar, but then of course the uh, panel discussion followed by a chef plated appetizer. Um, the $65 in-person ticket includes all of the above. Plus after the panel discussion, we will have dinner together and we can continue um, discussing with the panelists and enjoying the restaurant and each other's company. We're also offering a virtual ticket option. So if tickets sell out, or if you're not that comfortable yet coming out into a live event, uh, we will have that hosted live um, as an option. So those are free tickets of the virtual events, but we will have an option for you if you want to donate uh, to the restaurant staff. So all ticket proceeds and donations will go directly to covering food costs and to uh, the kitchen staff and the restaurant staff as well. So yeah. Thank you so much for your time. There's so much more information coming out. You guys are actually the first to hear of this event. Uh, and as a thank you for being a part of these lecture series, we wanted to let you guys know first that this was happening. Um, so more um, information to come. Um, enjoy your night. Thank you so much. And we'll see you April 27th. Excellent. Thanks so much, Katie, for sharing that information. Um, and what will end up happening is when we um, release the second video, we'll also hopefully have the link to the online ticketing site as well. Um, yes. So everyone be prepared to, to get those tickets and join us on the 27th. Yeah. Excellent. All right. So we're just, just going to jump right in and move into our first. Um, and I'm going to ask, let's see ask Jenny to unmute because she'll be our first person. Um, you can see her bio on the screen. Uh, we'll leave this up for a bit as Jenny talks and then we'll um, stop sharing the screen so you can 
enjoy her brilliant personality as she's talking to us. Um, so Jenny, thank you again for joining us and um, take it away. Okay, well, hi everyone. Um, it's so great to be with all of you tonight. I cannot wait till we get to be in person. This would be one of those really fun local groups that like just really, I think we all thrive off of each other's energy when we're in room together. So I'm looking forward to um, to that very soon. Um, in the on the um, theme of adaptation and resilience. I was thinking about this and, you know, I think that, <laughs> I think it's pretty fair to say that this has been the story of my life. As a matter of fact, um, because of COVID and this year, I have been quite a high demand speaker, I would say. This is uh, for me um, almost weekly, if not several times a week, being called to speak about the topic of resilience. And that's because I think that my story has become really tied with that word. Um, it's not necessarily something that I intended, of course, in my life, uh, that everyone knows how many times I've fallen down and gotten back up. But uh, I guess I would say I'm extraordinarily proud of it and I certainly earned it. And, uh, and so that's my story. All roads for me lead back to food. And so I don't even think, I don't think that I necessarily um, have to have to sort of start and end with food for me because it's all around me in my entire life. Um, obviously as an ice cream maker and a non-typical ice cream maker, one that's actually working directly with makers, growers, producers, the people who bring the food to life and the flavor to life for us, um, I, I have access to incredible, um, I would just say human beings who then grow us beautiful ingredients, which then allow us to make really beautiful ice creams for you. It's a beautiful system. And every year it's about pivoting. Every year, many, many things go wrong within that system. And there's no, we don't have as a company, a vision of the future where, okay, now everything is gonna be perfect and we know exactly what we're doing. And we, you know, because we're working with nature and we're working with many people, we're not calling one phone number and ordering all of our, you know, flavorings and pastes and whatever from one corporation. We are calling uh, dozens of families and human beings every year and relying on rain to make things like strawberries happen for us in that year. Um, I years ago looked up the word flavor in the dictionary because, um, you know, I knew that we kind of use it for lots of, we sort of use it for, you know, what's your flavor, you know, um, to mean, uh, you know, personality and actually the definition of the word flavor is the essential character of something. And it's something that I think about a lot because obviously that applies to so many things. Um, it applies to us as human beings and we talk about it a lot in our company and it applies to uh, a company. Um, the company that we've created that's called Jenny's but that is made up of hundreds of people now thousands of people and united by the values that we share. Um, we, we, people are attracted to work for our company because they've heard something about those values. And I do think that there is, um, that business has, uh, a, can be a powerful force for good in the world. Um, uh, while I don't think that business is human, I think that we, because we are made up of human beings, uh, we do have values and we should be making them known and that there's not really a separation between our front of the house and the back of the house now. So when you come into a Jenny's, you're speaking directly to somebody who works in our company, who has access to all of the things that we actually do behind the scenes. And that person we hope is really proud of everything we do, including you know, working directly with our makers, growers and producers. But so Jenny's now is a company, as I mentioned, of a couple of thousands of people. I mean, that's when you include everyone out in our shops, the, you know, truck drivers and everybody that, that has something to do with uh, uh, on, on our payroll. Um, we have 53 stores, which is still mind blowing to me, especially thinking that my um, sort of ethos for this company came from a farmer's market and still operates 
very much like that. And actually still with many of the makers and growers and farmers um, that I met in the 1990s when I first started my first ice cream business. And, and in fact, one of my farmers, like we're the same generation where they, they, we were born like in the same month of the same year. And, uh, and we've almost like grown up together. Um, so yeah, so we're 53 stores. We have a really beautiful online presence and we are in like 4,000 groceries across America. It's been a long, long long slog, but it's fun to go to new cities and, and to be growing like this and to have people say to me, like, you know, you know, wow, like, this is so cool. Like, you know, and just think that we just started. Uh, but for me, it goes back more than half my life. I, um, actually started making ice cream when I was 22 years old. That's actually quite a bit more than half my life ago now. And I never actually really worked for anyone else in a professional job. So I think that when we talk about this, um, theme of adaptation and resilience, I, I think I just want to kind of tell you how that story evolved, how we got to this place, um, because it has been a really long journey. And I think um, also young people now, uh, and maybe it was like this when I was young too, but I wasn't paying attention as much, or there wasn't the same kind of media, I think are kind of shown that things should move very quickly, whether it's you're, you're building a company or you're building your life or, you know, your personal brand or whatever that is. I feel like we're sort of shown that like entrepreneurship is strapping a rocket on your back, you know, learning how to do a pitch, walking into a room of, you know, VC funders and pitching. And actually entrepreneurship is very different than that. And I think that it can change the world if we can get back to this. I think it can create you know, economic equity for communities and economic vibrancy in communities. And I'm really passionate about that kind of in my other world, but it takes longer than, than that. And what it's really about is making something that you're passionate about that you know so well, whether it's skateboarding or, you know, um, medicine, um, that you are the right person to be doing that thing and innovating that thing. And then convincing someone else to, to, that it's a value. That is entrepreneurship, right? And you do that over and over again, and you build a community and you grow with that community and you continue to go. That's entrepreneurship. That's the kind of entrepreneurship that I call start small and build entrepreneurship. And for me, it starts way back in uh, when I was, uh, well, actually when I was a kid, I used to have lots of businesses. I mean, growing up, that's what we did. Um, I had uh, one grandmother, her name was Enid and she was beautiful and just a uh, spitfire. And my grandfather on that side, my father's parents, they had 10 acres of forest land. Enid was an artist. Grand, my grandfather was, um, had been an optometrist, but at the time I, by the time I knew him, he was sort of a thorough historian and they both uh, had been known in their community in Illinois, in the middle of Illinois, central Illinois, to have read every book in the library. So they had to order books out or get all the new ones. Um, they were quite, uh, sort of eccentric pair, but we had 10 acres of forest land where we would grow uh, little gardens wherever the sun would break through the trees. And so sometimes in a year, there might be 12 or 15 gardens um, growing everything from just my grandmother's favorite flower, which were gladiolas. It was a whole just patch of gladiolas to root vegetables, we had wild uh, mushrooms we picked. We had wild berries. We had cultivated berries. We had uh, orchard fruits. We had literally anything you can grow in soil uh, growing there. We had honeybees that we had our own honey from, and we tapped the maple trees every winter to get uh, a whole year's worth of maple syrup for my entire family. My grandmother, being an artist, um, equated um, uh, sensory experiences um, with art and making things. And so that was sort of the beginning for me um, of that life. Um, but I would go to my other grandmother's house and Enid would teach us how to do something. We would literally pick cattails from the forest, you know, by the creek, uh, those long sort of grasses, and we would dry them in the sunshine and then we would dye them and make baskets out of them. That was just one example of many things that we did with Enid. When I took that to Betty's, Betty would say, let's make a whole bunch of these and sell them, right? I know somebody who wants this, right? So it was this really great dynamic um, sort of tension almost between uh, these two extremely different people and how they viewed the world that created me in many ways. Um, fast forward my life, my family like blows up in a massive way, just to smithereens. I have no safety net, no family. My father's been out of my life for several years. 
that family was out of my life at that point. My mother had a baby and she's very sick. She was out of my life. My sister had gone off somewhere else and I was very much alone. And I decided that I was going to get into Ohio State University. And this is a person who barely got through high school. In fact, I, I thought I was pretty smart engineering my high school to be straight D's so that I could work because I liked working um, at a French bakery that I worked at. Um, they, of course, did not let me in because they don't let D students, straight D students at Ohio State, you know, the Ohio State University. Uh, but I convinced them after I wrote a letter of appeal. I, uh, I wrote a letter of appeal on notebook paper and I sent them in uh, and I told them what I'd been up to, which was basically working and um, and and just doing things and uh, that my teachers all liked me and um, and they uh, let me in what was going on in my family. So they allowed me to come into Ohio State University, which was the greatest thing ever. Um, so I started Ohio State, but um, because, you know, maybe because I've been raised by sort of alternative thinkers and different kinds of people, I didn't want to get on a track to a degree. I wanted to take all of the things that sounded fun because one of the greatest things about one of the most massive universities on the planet is that you can take classes on vampire folklore or like, you know, multiple different, um, very specific elements of the French Revolution. Um, a, a class just on ancient or even pre-Hellenistic society, like economies, right? Which was a class that I barely survived, but it was extremely interesting. So I just went around and took all these classes that I wanted to take. I took a lot of fine arts. I took a lot of art history and, um, and I met a lot of people. I went to other departments. I met a wonderful um, French guy named Julian, um, who was, who grew up in Paris and he and I became buds and he was working on some, uh, he was in the chemistry department. He was working on scent and I started playing around with scent. It was the most incredible thing ever. I had never really heard of that. It was sort of linked to perfuming and he would bring me little vials of scent. And, um, I was also working at the French bakery. I worked at a French bakery since, you know, high school, I had worked there and, uh, and actually my first job had been in uh, at an ice cream shop uh, at Graders. I was their very first employee in Columbus, actually, um, and still friends with them today. Um, so I was kind of just like exploring everything that I wanted to explore. And through that, I found ice cream, the, the most important thing in my entire, like the, the, the biggest, I mean, the biggest thing in my entire life was just simply because of this one moment that happened. And that was, I had uh, been invited to a dinner party and I had been collecting uh, various scent compounds. So a lot of essential oils basically, and, uh, and some other natural compounds that have scent and using them to blend perfumes. And I thought I should become a perfumer uh, because I was working at the pastry shop. I was also thinking, well, maybe I should become a pastry chef. And I was making pastries at home. Um, and, uh, and I'd still loved, you know, the art and doing art. And so I was thinking about how can I make art into a career? But one night I was going to a, a party, a dinner party, and I decided to take an essential oil of rose. It was a Bulgarian rose that I had to save a lot of money to buy. Um, and I, and mix it into vanilla ice cream and basically make an edible perfume, put it that way. Um, I did that one. And then I also did an oil of cayenne that I had that had heat, but no, uh, scent. And I put that in chocolate ice cream. And when I took a bite, when I tasted that ice cream, my entire life changed because I had been studying all of the things that I wanted to study. I had studied ancient perfuming and, uh, and, and some of the chemistry around fats and, and that ancient perfumers would, some, would, would sort of uh, scent the, the fat, fat that was solid at room temperature, but, but melted on contact with your body. Um, and I understood that butter fat was exactly that. In fact, it melts two degrees below body temperature. So it's the perfect thing to carry scent and then melt it on contact with your tongue. Because I had studied all of these things that I, that I was you know, excited about, um, I knew the power of ice cream uh, to carry scent, also to tell stories uh, because I'd been studying history and I'd been studying folklore and I'd been studying anthropology and art and art history. And I loved that storytelling um, aspect of all of those things. Um, and then of course, because I had been working in, at the bakery and, uh, and understanding actually how to use food in the kitchen and how uh, people interact with food. And I was learning from a French family how to bring beautiful, fresh flavors to life versus like the you know, American desserts of like blue frosting, which I also still love. But um, 
So I had learned all those things. And so when I found that moment of ice cream, it was like all of the things that I was super passionate about. It was the crossroads of all of those things. And it was truly like an epiphany in my life. Like I, um, I think of, you know, these idea of, you know, there's a million, we all have a million ideas every day, right? There's a million ideas of what we could do as a business or, or anything as a project. Um, but ideas are just kind of ideas. They're almost like worth nothing. They're actually worth probably less than nothing because they're distractions from what you should be doing or what you could be doing of value. Unless you can project it into the future, see the world in a way um, after the idea is, uh, is kind of enacted in, it, in full bloom, um, and then it sort of becomes your rocket fuel. You know, once you sort of see that world, and that was what happened to me in that moment, I just saw that uh, ice cream in America could be so much better. Um, I remembered all of the things that I had grown up eating and thinking about what if we could use, you know, really beautiful honey in ice creams or some of the gorgeous ingredients like my grandparents were growing um, or like I go to the market and buy. What if I could do all of that in ice cream? Um, well, you know what? If Ben and Jerry's can do it, I can do it too. Literally, that was my business plan. Um, and so that moment was the most important moment uh, in my life. And I can only, I sometimes think back, like, what if it hadn't happened? Or what if, what if I hadn't observed it in the way that I did or grabbed onto it in the way that I did? Um, my whole life would be so different, obviously. A um, few weeks later, I was, uh, I walked into one of my figure drawing classes or my figure drawing class and uh, a model walked in um, that I was actually always having trouble drawing. She was very beautiful, very tall, very slender. And I couldn't do the angles, you know, of like her hip bones or whatever. I love to draw big. And, um, and so, you know, with like the radius of my arm, I draw on big paper. And so I love, you know, round people. And, um, and I was just thinking that I was going to be you know, in this class for three hours when really all I wanted to do is go home and make ice cream. It happened to be portfolio week in art, which is a big deal when, you know, you don't have a family to fall back on. You don't have a safety net. You've spent all of your money on your art supplies and you now have this big portfolio of everything you've worked on there. But I didn't want to disrupt the class uh, too much. And I knew in my heart that I wasn't coming back. So I stood up off of my drawing horse. That's what they call the drawing. I don't know if you're not in art, you probably don't know this, but it's like a, you straddle this horse with your, it, it's a wooden um, sort of desk that you sit on with your paper um, in front of you. And I stood up and kind of backed away and walked around the class and left. And I left all of my art supplies. These are really expensive, hundreds of dollars worth of pencils and, and everything I needed to do that. I left my paper and I left my portfolio and I rode my bike home and I made ice cream and never went back to Ohio State. I, um, I opened my first business in the North Market a few months later. I had convinced a friend and she convinced her parents to give us a couple uh, well, let's say about $20,000 to start in the market. And I worked there every day for four years. And I learned literally everything I know about ice cream in those four years, even though that business in itself uh, didn't succeed uh, in, in terms of customers. I learned that um, that entrepreneurship isn't art. It's different than art. And you can't think like an artist. You have to have a two-way conversation with your customers instead of that sort of one-sided um, thing that artists do so well. Um, but I learned so much close. It was called scream ice cream. I close scream. And, uh, and I opened Jenny's two years later in the North market. Um, and the rest is history. So I will leave you with that. I can't wait for our discussion. And also just remind you too, that, um, that the idea of flavor and character is about, you know, sort of life being a sort of choose your own adventure. It's not an adventure unless it's hard and it kind of hurts and that's okay. That's what makes you kind of awesome. And I'll give it to the next person. And so next up we have uh, Minister Aaron and Antoinette Hopkins. Um, so we should see their bio on the screen and I'm going to ask them to unmute. And hopefully that'll work out. And then um, once you've done that, you can go ahead and get started. Um, just so you know, I have a photo of one of your farms. And so I'll let you start talking and then we'll move on to that screen and then I will uh, minimize the screen as well. So folks can watch you so you can go ahead and take it away. Okay, all right. Well, good evening to everyone. Um, so glad to be here and uh, to have this opportunity um, just to share kind of our story, uh, to even speak about uh, adapt adaptation and resilience and 
man, what a journey. And so uh, we want to thank Miss Jenny. That, that was energizing, uh, just to, even in hearing her story and how complex it is. And it just, uh, while we were sitting here, it, it allowed us to reflect uh, on our journey. Um, and so I, I would want to say that me and me and Miss Antoinette have been, uh, we've been together for 42 years, might be 43 years, but we've been married for 38 of those years, um, the 39 this year. And uh, so we have uh, six grown children and like 24 grandchildren, mm -hmm. and they are very much part of the story. And so um, I was feeling something as Miss Jenny uh, was just sharing her story and um, just how things in life happen. And, uh, you know, and so um, I, I, I really, I, I really thank her for just kind of preluding us into this. And um, we're very much uh, a people of faith, um, haven't always been in this lane that we're in now and walking by faith. Uh, I remember when we made the decision in this community in which we live here on the South side, uh, uh, we've lived in, in this this house here for uh, 30, about 30, close to 30 years, but uh, probably about maybe 25 years ago, we made the decision that, hey, something's got to break. And uh, we went to a place of worship right in our community, had to walk our children, six children, down the, um, down the road. And, uh, you know, life for us had changed dramatically over those um, 24 years, 25 years. Uh, I'm sure it's more than that. I, you know, I just never really stopped to reflect on it, but uh, I know out of it, uh, I ended up getting a job where I um, just kind of something like retirement, just left it uh, here after 28 years. Uh, you know, I got that job from a relationship that I had met at the church. And so uh, it was at that church, Family Missionary Baptist Church. Um, uh, my pastor is Frederick V. Lamar. Um, uh, also lives in the community. Uh, um, me and him have a very close relationship in that we are very much the same age, uh, just a day apart. Um, both live here in the community. Um, he comes from a very large family and uh, I'm from a small family, but now have a large family. But it was at Family Missionary Baptist Church that uh, I would think that road to adaptation um, really started for me, you know, I was thinking that I was going to talk about COVID, but um, adapting to life uh, and finding resilience happened for me um, some time ago. And so um, this thing about starting the community gardens, it, it happened out of some things going on in our community. Uh, oh, um, I, I would say because of the economics in the community and the lack of uh, Oh, in summer jobs, things to keep young people active and to keep them engaged uh, in profitable ways in a community that is an underserved community um, with uh, mid to low level incomes. Um, it's changed over the years. And so um, we had a lot of crime going on, a lot of gunfire, much like it is now uh, happening in our city but we started a, a project to engage these young people that we were going to give them some skills to teach them uh teach them some hand you know to use hand tools uh drills and saws and tape measures and uh show them how to build uh, some garden fences because uh we wanted to connect these young people to these grand grandmothers and grandfathers that was in the community a lot of grandmothers But uh, I'm still with you. Uh, and, uh, and, and we started a project. We built a community garden at the church and really uh, developed a passion to want to educate these young, young people on this urban farm. It wasn't urban farming then. We were building garden fences and putting some vegetables out there on the back lot. And uh, we wasn't ex addressing... Um, fresh food access at the time. We were trying to give these young people some options, uh, some things to help them deal with the trauma of 
this inner city life and some skills that would help them uh, move past, uh, uh, conf give them some better conflict resolution, and also to teach them a respect for their elders, uh, to get to know these older, uh, these aging community, um, to really uh, take time to listen to what their story is and listen to what these seniors had to say. And so we started our, our first garden in the community uh, and it was called Growing Community and Family Concerns. And uh, it's on a city land bank property. This is a, the picture you're looking at there, that's our second. And so um, that's probably about maybe four years down the road, about four years down the road that happened. But uh, the other garden, um, that growing community and family concerns. Uh, we started out a city land bank property, did not really have any funding. We just had a whole lot of passion that, hey, we want to build a place where these uh, young people can, well, no, more so that the seniors can start coming out of their house into a safe place into the community uh, that they could begin to interact with other seniors. Um, you see that orange sign that's in that picture, uh, that's a sign for our civic association. Southside CAN is what they call it, but it's Southside Community Action Network. And so I am the current president of that civic uh, here on the South Side. Um, um, and it's one of the older civics in the community. Um, at one time, we had a lot of uh, blue collar jobs, factory jobs that was in the area, those closed. And uh, you know things kind of went downhill in our community, but so this thing about growing your own food, these grandmas knew how to do it, but we needed them to be able to teach these young people how to do it. And um, so we started getting some support about the the time that I started that garden. Uh, uh, we got all involved in Earth Day and had some folks out from city council came out and helped us and. Uh, um, some folk people started seeing what we were doing. And, um, and so we developed a relationship actually with Ohio State uh, and it's out of in fact, and it was a, a Kellogg project, uh, Buckeye um, in fact ISA and the ISA was institutionally supported agriculture. And um, they had a, a goal of um, um, teaching these young people that, you know, if they had a family of eight years, uh, uh, eight years old, um, that they would uh, support them with uh, um, educational and resources to be able to grow at home. And uh, we said, wait, they can come to our site. Um, you know, we can grow as a community and we'll provide our site and uh, um, do these sites and grow in these community. And so uh, the resilience in there was, uh, you know, uh, it, it was challenging at first because there were no resources and, you know, we did not have resources. And so um, there was a, another relationship uh, from uh, uh, Mid-Ohio Food Food Bank, it's a collaborative now, but uh, they had a USDA grant that uh, funded our other site with electricity and water, uh, helped us to build raised beds. Um, um, and then, uh, you know, out of resilience, you know, a lot of people were skeptical, did not think that we were going to get that done, uh, but we did. And uh, there was a lot of pushback in the community, even with this on the land bank properties. Some, you know, at this time, um, and, and it's still happening in our community, um, housing prices are skyrocketing. These vacant lots have become, you know, something that people want. And, uh, um, you know, you could easily get forced off of those properties if you, if you don't, uh, um, and so there's that adaptation again and uh, finding the resilience uh, to build something that is sustainable. Uh, people say, if we fund you this year, where are you gonna, how are you gonna make this? How will you make this? Uh, what will you do next year? Will you be back for funds again next year? And so, uh, it's been four to five years looking for sustainability. Uh, it, it moved into fresh food access very fast when we realized that no, these people don't have, you know, we are a borderline food desert. Uh, and then, um, you know, people are limited with transportation in my community and their access uh, 
uh, to get there is, is very challenged. The bus routes are there, but it's not, you know, you have to walk so far to get to the bus routes and then to bring your groceries and stuff home. But a lot of barriers there. But so when we started moving down this road of looking at this fresh food access, you know, um, um, we found other barriers and challenges, not just COVID. We haven't even got to COVID yet. Uh, but we had to find resilience to be able to sustain this urban farming and to be able to get these people involved, you know, get the community involved, the youth, and then to keep them involved. You know, we were finding that a lot of uh, people in our community were not, uh, be able, could not identify a lot of the different fruits and vegetables. There was some stuff we learned, you know, uh, that, uh, you know, my mom was a home ec teacher, but I had never had kohlrabi. Uh, I never had kohlrabi and uh, what's some of the other things we, uh, um, no, a lot of different things that we just, you know, aren't used to seeing. And so a lot of our community had never, what's a cucumber? You know, they know a pickle, but they don't know a cucumber. You don't know. Um, and so um, that trying to find resilience to make it appealing to people. And so the best way is to um, uh, make it where um, they want to eat it. And so um, what would you what would you say? What would you say has been one of the fun ways to keep the youth to help us find that resilience? Um, I think um, just teaching them and harvesting or even like um, when they plant the seed to see the see the fruit that comes from the um, mm -hmm. seed that they planted um, when they water it and nurture it and you know, mm -hmm. then they're able to eat it. I know one time I can remember us being in the garden and we had um, sweet 100 um, cherry tomatoes and the kids would be like, can we eat them now? You know, and I was like, sure, you can pick it off. We'll wash it and eat it. And, and it was just the fact that them having access uh, ready availability to be able to do that, you know, just pick it off, wash it and eat it. It was just something that was able to get them to know what a tomato was or to know what a cherry tomato was and how it mm -hmm. tastes. Um, I think in really just teaching them and showing them the difference from the fruits and vegetables that's grown in the garden rather than brought in the store was the different taste mm -hmm. because it is a different taste. So, mm -hmm. um, I would say that and then like different activities that we have for them in the garden. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, and so even she just hit a point there uh, because a lot of people in this community don't know where their food comes from. They think it comes from the grocery store. They never realize that it's grown on a farm. And sometimes those farms might be uh, hundreds of miles away. And, uh, but they, the one thing we started seeing is that they never considered themselves as farmers and seeing themselves having that ability to grow. And so when Miss Jenny was talking and she was sharing all those experiences about growing up in an urban area, in a, in a country environment, all of those uh, sensory things and uh, all those things that you could expose to, all the things you could grow, you can eat, you can taste, um, wonderful country meals and being able to pluck it off the vine, all those experiences. You know, we found that, you know, we have the struggles that there's people in the community have not been out of, mm -hmm. you know, 270. Mm -hmm. You know, they have not seen that life. And so um, then COVID and, you know, right in the midst of us doing all of that and building their interest and wanting to take them on field trips to see other urban farms, you know, um, uh, COVID kind of hit and kind of, you know, put a damper on things. And so um, Zoom was actually a blessing is that we could reach into their homes and we could give them things virtually, um, begin to show them uh, places that they never imagined. And so we're doing pretty good at holding, holding their attention, but we're really excited about our CSA program this year, um, being able to deliver these boxes of vegetables uh, into their community. One thing is challenged though, you know, even as we're preparing for this season within this community is, you know, there's been a lot of uh, food boxes being given away. And so, and so that's something that we've been having to prepare for. There's a lot of families that are in the community that have been affected by, negatively by COVID and their work. And so 
um, where we were looking to have a moderately priced CSA box that we could deliver, you know, um, uh, we we find ourselves really relying on our faith right now is how God going to work that thing out and that we can get it to them and that uh, another door might be opened. Uh, there is a program that we're participating in called Farm Share um, that some resources have been put together that we can begin to distribute uh, these boxes uh, at no cost to us. And we're also compensated for um, delivering them and also maybe compensated they're buying some of those vegetables from us and then we distribute them free. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that has been uh, part of the resilience that uh, we've been finding. And so we're still looking for avenues to succeed. We've got two acres that uh, we're getting ready to uh, bring all those fresh vegetables into this community. And we're just looking for, um, you know, uh, the COVID uh, guidelines to uh, hopefully around August, um, we can begin to plan events where we're going to have cooking in the garden and we can have select families come through. We're going to actually cook meals in the garden, uh, really teach a lot about the dietary uh, benefits and those things. And uh, um, and so it, it's been good. Uh, um, our house of worship uh, did not close. And so I, I found my resilience in my work. I'm a passionate person about the work that I'm doing. Um, COVID happened right at the beginning of so much social unrest in our community. And, uh, um, you know, and it really strained things. It opened my eyes to things, uh, um, even the story about the black farmer and being forced off the land. And then now how do I, you know, deal with the stigmas of these young people while I, I want to expose them to agriculture and ecology. I, I grew up a landscaper and wanted to be a horticulturalist, but you know, how do we begin to inspire them to want to be the be in that lane? And uh, and so uh, uh, we have found our resilience. We're holding on to our hope. We're excited about the season. And hey, it was above 60 degrees today, and the COVID numbers is, you know they're going the other way. And mm -hmm. so we're just glad about the vaccines and we're just uh, really honored to be here and to be involved in this discussion. Excellent, thanks so much uh, Minister Aaron and Antoinette for sharing your, your story. And, um, you know, hopefully we're gonna have time uh, during the Q&A to dig deeper into that. Our final uh, presenter, last but not least, is Dr. Barbara Piperata. I'm going to um, return back to sharing my screen here. All right, and then um, Barbara, you should be unmuted so you can go ahead and um, take it away. Well, good evening, everybody. I thank you all for coming out. It's a pleasure to participate in this event. I thank uh, Mark Anthony and the others involved in the Anthropology Public Outreach Program or APOP for organizing these events. I think they're a great opportunity to share experiences and information, um, especially when we have a common theme like we do today. Um, I've been inspired by the two previous speakers and I'm going because I just have a professor hat on most of my life. I am so st stuck to that kind of a model. Um, I sent Mark Anthony um, a presentation that I thought I could use to talk about some of the research that I've done on um, food security. But before I start, um, I think just to give you a little bit of background, I mean, I identify, you know, I'm a human biologist, I'm a nutritional anthropologist, I have long been interested in food. Um, I am an Italian American, I grew up in a very uh, family that took great pride in that identity, and our food was the center of everything. Um, it was, you know, it was in every part of everything that we did, um, it brought us together. Um, and so I think that's always been such a huge part of who I am is food and an interest in food. And I went you know, to school, um, I don't know, I've always liked science. I got a bachelor's degree in biology from the University of New Mexico. And soon after I got married, I always say I was a child bride. Um, I got married very young um, and my, we moved to Boulder, Colorado. And I was very fortunate because I came, you know, that's the 1990s. I was able to go right into a job um, working in a biotech company. I was trained to be an analytical chemist there. It taught me all kinds of skills, gave me enormous amounts of, of 
faith in my ability to do science um, and to think about things and to become innovative. Um, and I got bored there really fast. And I think that's the Gemini part of my personality. I just knew I couldn't stay indoors. I didn't want to do that job forever, but I was very grateful for the opportunity to learn an enormous number of things. And I also think about how much resilience I had as a young person being able to go to college for a very reasonable cost that never uh, burdened me with the debt, that I was able to walk away from that job, quit my job, um, getting paid a very nice wage at a very young age, um, and leave because I was given the opportunity to go to Nicaragua on an archaeological expedition. And that combined with my heritage, I think, of, of just a paying attention to food and being interested in food and knowing how important food is to one's identity and to one's health and well-being, um, my experience there transformed my life and it drove me back into education. And I wound up getting my master's and PhD in anthropology with a strong focus on studying food and the way in which food shapes people's lives. And so I'm gonna talk about that today um, but that's how I got to Nicaragua um, originally, and OSU gave me a chance to go back there as a professor. And so um, I'm going to talk about that experience here and some issues of resiliency, but also I think a lot for us to think about that really overlaps with the two previous speakers, um, certainly the efforts going on on the south side of what happens when we are, when we create environments where people are insecure. And what is the impact of that insecurity on people's well-being? And that has been a central theme of the research that I have done is how people cope with uh, resource insecurities and the impact that that has on their well-being. So um, I'm gonna talk about that in Nicaragua. So just, just to be, so we're all on the same page, food security has a definition that many of us in academia use to frame what we're doing. Um, and that definition is that food security exists when all people at all times have physical, and economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food that meets their dietary needs and food preferences. Um, and that's an important part for an anthropologist. We don't eat everything that's available in our environment, okay? We choose our foods and those are based on who we are and our culture and our identity. And that's very important. And it's, and it's getting access to these things that allow us to have an active and healthy life and to participate in society and to build family and to build community um, and to participate in an event like this. Um, a lot of times when people think about food security, I think they immediately think about its availability. And I want to dissuade you from thinking about that. This planet has plenty of food on it. Um, the problem is access. And this has to be our focus is that people simply do not have access. And that is because we have, as a global society, decided that we are going to be very, very, very skewed and unequal in the distribution of wealth and in the distribution of power. And that power is in the hands of few and they control the way food is produced, they control the way food is distributed and ultimately where food gets to and who gets it. And um, the story I'm gonna tell today through the experiences of Nicaraguan women will highlight uh, the outcome of, of that disparity. Um, so we can move to the next slide. Um, about 2 billion people, and I want you to remind yourself that there's about 7 billion on this planet right now, Two billion of them live under conditions that we would consider to be food insecure. And 98% of those people living in those conditions are in low and middle income countries. All that part of the map here that's colored in with various shades um, of color. But we shouldn't forget, of course, that in a country as wealthy as the United States, we have plenty of food insecurity. And um, if I were to dissect that map, which I just don't have time for today, we would see uh, all kinds of pockets of food insecurity. It's everywhere. In fact, in Columbus, Ohio, about 17% of the population is food insecure. Um, and the women and children of the world are at greatest risk. Now, when we think about food insecurity, we, um, especially as a human biologist, I've been very interested in the way in which it affects health. And we know that, you know, if you're not food insecure, you don't get in at, you don't get adequate intakes of, of nutrients. Um, it puts you at risk of getting a bunch of chronic diseases because of the food choices that you're often forced to make, which are energy dense and nutrient poor foods that lead to things like diabetes and cardiovascular disease. We know it has devastating effects on pregnancy um, and pregnancy outcomes. We know that children who do not have access to a, a good diet um, suffer cognitively. They cannot do well in school and take advantage of any educational opportunities we give them. 
Um, and then we also know that it has mental health implications, but this has been the least studied aspect of food security. And this is what um, drove my question in Nicaragua, which is what I'm gonna talk about today. So I was interested in knowing the association between food insecurity and mental health in this context. And like I said, since women and children are at most uh, risk, I was very focused on understanding mother's experiences. And I also had a little sub question because when we talk about resilience, uh, social support networks are often a major source of resiliency for many people. And Jenny talked about her experience and having safety nets early and then losing them and that importance of those things and how they shape our decisions, right? So um, I was very interested to know if social support in women's lives, and we looked at three different kinds of support, what, they, what women would describe as a more generalized social network that would include friends, family, but mostly other resources within a community setting and then spousal support, and then parental support specifically. So very specific types of support. And then a second question I was really interested in um, as an ethnographer and really the, the kind of cultural side of me. So I have this sort of biocultural side of everything I do. I've got this biologist on one shoulder. I've got this sort of cultural anthropologist on the other. I wanted to know how food insecurity undermines um, maternal mental health, if it did. I wanted to know the pathways. What, what is that? Because we need to identify those things if we're going to um, not just solve the food security problem, but solve the mental health problem. Because believe it or not, mental health is the leading cause of disability among women in low and middle income countries. It's not other diseases. It's mental, it's poor mental health. So we need to understand the causes of poor mental health. And in this particular case of food securities contributed to it, I wanted to know how. Um, so why does that relationship exist? So um, we conducted this study in Nicaragua and it was a great privilege for me um, to be able to go back to this country that sent me on my career path. Um, and we started this work in 2012. And you can see that Nicaragua is situated in Central America. It's the second poorest country in the Western hemisphere with Haiti being the first. Um, and it has an enormous degree of income inequality. It's actually quite similar to the, quite similar to the United States in this way. Um, and so I wanted just to give you this map so you can see where it was, we can move on. And then um, Leon is where we conducted the study, which is that red area on the map. And these are some pictures from Leon. Now Leon is a department, which is the equivalent of a state in Nicaragua, like in a US state. Um, and Leon is the, is the second largest city um, in the country. And it's the city of Leon is situated in the state of Leon. And I show a few pictures here just so you can see what the landscape looks like. It's a volcanic area. There are volcanoes everywhere. It's quite beautiful. Um, and I give you a picture of an urban and a peri-urban kind of setting so you can see the way people live and what they have access to. There are markets everywhere. There is food everywhere. I cannot stress this enough. This is not a place where there is no food. There's food everywhere. It's just that not everybody can get it because they don't have money. Um, and so we, um, we can move to the next slide. Um, so let's talk about uh, the situation of food insecurity in Nicaragua and women's particular role here and, uh, and conditions, I guess I should say here. Um, over the course of Nicaragua, Nicaragua's had a very volatile history and the United States has played a role in that. Um, and over time, especially the latter half of the 20th century, Nicaragua has gone through uh, an economic opening, um, in many ways forced economic opening, where many things that were once public became privatized and uh, land was concentrated in the hands of very wealthy people. So a lot of rural folks fled uh, the, the rural areas as they lost access to land um, and became part of the urban poor. Um, and so Nicaragua still has the remnants of that um, where most of the population has moved into urban centers and they live um, uh, on the kinds of jobs that one can get in those sorts of places. Now, the big uh, uh, sources of income in Leon are the free trade zone, which is where the maquiladoras or the factories are. These free trade zones are uh, transnational corporations own them. They mostly employ women. They pay very low wages. They have very difficult working conditions. Uh, people have very few working rights. Women are often dismissed if they're pregnant um, from their job, they're fired. Um, and they are also uh, not usually employable after the age of 35. So women are very vulnerable to only having jobs during certain segments of the life course. And if they get pregnant during that period of time, they can easily just lose their job. 
So a great portion of people reply, uh, rely on work in the informal economy, which means that they just do odd jobs, uh, sell things on the street, wash people's homes. Uh, this means that they don't feed into a tax system. That means that they have no security in old age. Um, so they just work for whatever the uh, wage that a, the person who hires them is willing to pay. Um, and some people who live in rural areas, most of the ones in the area of Leon where I, we conducted this study, um, they live in, um, in, they might live in a rural area, but the land belongs to someone else. And the owner of that land may allow them to plant some things, but most of it is for them to either help harvest the crops that the owner then sells on the market um, or to uh, work as security to make sure that nobody else comes onto that land and steals any of the crops or, or squats and basically builds a home on that land because most of the land owners are wealthy and either live in cities or they live outside of Nicaragua completely. Um, and so that's kind of, so we see that agriculture has been in decline in this area um, and that most of the women in our study did work, but they mostly were working in either these uh, free trade zones or in the informal economy. So they were very, very economically insecure. Um, we can move on to the next slide. So the average age of the women in our study, there were 423 of them was 31 and they had an average of 3.2 children in their care. Um, when we interviewed them about their social network, they uh, described a very broad and strong social network. So they actually uh, reported a lot of very strong social support. They, on a scale of one to 13, they average a 10, which means they have a lot of social support. So this was not something that they said, you know, I don't have people in my life. I can't, they're not people that I can go to. No, in fact, they said the opposite of that. 79% um, of them were married or had a partner. And 53% of them lived in households. So over half of them lived in households with their parents. And this kind of family structure is related in, in a large part to economic conditions where you need to live in groups because then everybody's income is pooled so that you can pay your bills, okay? Um, and so much of the story you can see in the United States, you know, I don't need to go to Nicaragua to find a lot of this. 75% um, of the women in the sample reported being food insecure. And that ranged from being mildly food insecure, which is basically worrying a lot um, but not necessarily having to make quality and quantity sacrifices. Um, and then and that moved into a zone where 25% of the sample uh, reported having to really reduce the quality of their diet and make quantitative cuts to their diets where children and adults in the household were forced to skip meals or go entire days without eating because they had insufficient amounts of food. Um, we administered a, a, uh, uh, an interview to measure women's mental distress and they averaged a five on that but that instrument has 20 questions, so you can get a score from zero to 20, um, and many women scored a 20. So these are markers of anxiety and depression that the scale measures, and we're seeing uh, markers of anxiety and de depression along with food insecurity, but the question then becomes, is the food security related to it? Um, so we can go to the next slide. So the answer is, you know, to our basic question, is food insecurity associated with poor mental health, maternal mental health in this place? The big answer is yes, it is. I would have been shocked if it wasn't. So this is not a surprising finding. Um, but what we find that comes out of this becomes really interesting. So mothers who reported being mildly food insecure, more like that worrying level, but not necessarily always having to make sacrifices, had a 42% higher rate of mental distress than women who reported being food secure in the sample. But mothers who reported moderate and severe food insecurity, those mothers that had to make those qualitative and quantitative sacrifices, um, they had two times the rate of mental distress uh, compared to the women in this study that had that reported being food secure. So then that second little sub question was, well, let's talk about resilience. Let's talk about safety nets. Let's talk about, you know, do they make a difference in this place for this problem? So we've got food security as the insult to health here. And then we've got mental health as the health outcome that we're looking at. So the question is, does social support buffer that? Does it make you more resilient? Does it keep you from suffering the mental health consequences if you had it? And there are a lot of ways to measure social support. We looked at uh, three key ways here. Instrumental is like I can give you money or food, um, like real things, real tangible things. Information is that I can share with you ideas about how to stretch food or where to get cheaper food and things like that. That kind of it would be informational support. And then emotional support is pretty obvious to all of us. I'm there for you. You could talk to me about your problems. Um, I, I, I can empathize with you. So we looked at um, the, we were looking at these sort of uh, forms of social support, but also who provided them. Um, so we wanted to know um, 
you know, they were women reported getting these types of social support. We wanted to know if they were buffers in terms of the way in which food security impacted mental health. So I tried to collapse this down to go a little bit faster. But the quick answer is their support networks, even though they reported tapping into them and being able to utilize them to get access to food when needed, like being able to go to a, a corner store and ask for rice and beans to pay later, or to go to a neighbor and ask to borrow food. They reported being able to do that, but it didn't buffer their mental health, okay? And I'm gonna talk about that in a moment. Uh, when we explored the role of spousal support, it also served as no buffer. And I'll come back and talk about this. So having the spouse around was not necessarily a buffer in terms of mental health, but having their parents, particularly living with them and resolving this problem together did um, serve as a very strong buffer um, in protecting their mental health from the insult of uh, food insecurity. So now the interesting question becomes, well, what can we learn from ethnography from doing a mi mixed method study um, to look at why they're having, why food insecurity or how I should say food insecurity is undermining their mental health and why the network and the spousal support didn't seem to buffer them, but the parental support did because this teaches us about ways in which we could go in and try to help solve this problem in ways that are gonna help not just the food security, but the mental health. And so the first theme that came out of these, uh, we had two hour long, deep conversations with women about their experiences with food insecurity. Um, three of them were the focus groups with uh, five to 10 women in them that were in rural areas. And then um, uh, three of them were in urban areas. And these are the themes that uh, came out of those focus group discussions. So the first is that food security in this place was a chronic stressor. And I think we see this in the United States as well. It doesn't go away, it's a daily stressor. Um, and so this eats away at you. We call this now in the psychology literature, a toxic stressor. So these are some of the quotes that I'm sharing with you that the women uh, talked to us, uh, said, expressed while we were in there. It's a concern, it's an everyday worry. It makes me sad, it makes me wanna cry. When we have no work, we have no money to buy food. This makes us worried. Where am I going to get food for my child? This was every day. If they solved it with breakfast, they had to go back and, and do it for lunch. So they called this la lucha, the fight or the struggle um, for food, okay? And it was chronic. We can go to the next slide. The second theme that emerged um, was the stigma associated with it, which we also see in the United States. And this is why the network support was not a buffer. Because while women, women could, could tap into it to get the help and put food on the table, it made them feel terrible because food security is considered to be something that is highly stigmatized, that you're a failure as an individual if you can't feed your children. So we see this adoption of this like neoliberal model where you as an individual are responsible for a structural problem. Um, so this is a social problem that you're embodying and that you're considered to have to take responsibility for. And when you fail at it, then it is, is considered shameful. And so women were very worried to have to share this reality with people in their social network. They said, of course, I'll do it. I'm not going to let my children starve. But it is definitely devastating to my mental well-being because I feel like a loser. I feel like a lost cause. And the last theme um, is due to identity role. And I think this really speaks to women. Um, and it's particularly women as providers in our society and the gatekeepers of food security is that being unable to do this or being the one to have to solve this problem and often without the help of their spouse whose gender role doesn't make them have to solve this problem in this particular place, women felt as though they were failing as mothers and that's their most important social role. And so this took an enormous toll on their mental health. So I think this opens up um, a discussion about what it means to be resilient how we can build more resilient societies, how we can protect, protect those that are most vulnerable and to think about um, ways to solve both this issue globally and, in, and its impacts on health globally because they are significant and enormous and many people um, are, are dealing with this. So I will end it there. Thank you all. All right, excellent. Thanks so much, Dr. Parada for that. I'm sorry to rush you through, through that part. I just wanna make sure that we have some time for um, Q&A. Uh, we may, um, you know, full disclosure, go a little past um, our 7.15 mark. Um, so thank you all for your patience and for um, sticking around with us as long as you possibly can. Um, what I'm going to try and attempt to do here is, um, I need to first stop sharing here. I'm going to be unmuting or giving everyone the ability to unmute yourself if I am. Uh, 
You're muted. <laughs> Thanks. I'm, I'm just talking to myself at, at this point. Um, I just wanted to, I'm just noting that I've um, given everyone the ability to unmute yourself. Um, so if you have a question, by all means, um, please feel free to do so. Um, I'll be turning it over to Victoria, um, who's going to be um, actually um, corralling this Q&A. Um, I think I was uh, paused at the time when I, uh, or unmuted at the time that I said it, but it looks like we'll be going a little past 715. Um, so hopefully you all can um, join us at, you know, through this Q&A session. Um, we'll try and go for about 10, 15 minutes or so, and then we'll do our giveaways and then we'll wrap up. Um, so Victoria, um, go ahead and unmute yourself. Um, Jenny, Minister Aaron, Barbara, if you can just unmute yourselves and be ready to field questions. Um, Victoria and I have questions as well, but we'd like to open it up to the floor for um, our guests to ask ask away. Yeah, so if anyone has questions, you can either raise your hand or just jump in. If you don't feel comfortable talking, feel free to put them in the chat and I can read them out. Um, so I can just wait and see if anyone has questions. Okay, if not, I wrote some and then, oh wait, there is one. Um, so Lynn asked, where can I learn more about the CSA program being offered by the Hopkins? Um, we have a uh, website that uh, um, is still building out the CSA portion, but uh, you can find it on southsidefamilyfarms.com. And uh, I don't know if I can get it in the chat or not, but uh, um Yes, we are still plugging in everything about the CSA, but uh, our first week for the CSA program should be uh, June, the week of June 1st. 20, a 20 week, uh, 20 week CSA starting in June 1st. Uh, we will have other things that we're gonna be taking to farmer's market uh, um, that we have relationships with, but uh, we're really looking to uh, have the CSA go forward. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, one general question that I had, and Mark, you can jump in whenever if you have questions too, was how COVID has affected each of your programs or businesses um, individually, if you have anything you wanted to add about that. I mean, I'll, I'll jump in. It's clearly been a huge struggle to get people uh, to come into stores. Um, you know, we're just not giving the, you know, enough information. So even with masks, some people are very uh, fearful to go out and, um, and, and on and on. My company is doing okay because we have two other channels. And um, not that we would, we're doing as well as we would have without COVID, absolutely not. But we feel very fortunate and very lucky. And so I've been able to be an advocate uh, both locally and uh, with the federal government and some of the, the sort of small business policy that's coming to life um, right now uh, for other small businesses and, and actually small, small businesses, main street businesses. So I've been working a lot on that in my um, sort of free time or whatever, because, um, and in also uh, in, in, in working on how we're going to froth up new entrepreneurship in this country and with who. So hoping that it will be a much more diverse group. I can certainly speak to the impact that COVID's had on education um, and training students. So um, I talked about the Nicaraguan work. The work I actually talked about today was conducted prior to COVID, but we had an ongoing project in Nicaragua that was looking at both food and water insecurity. Um, we had to not, I mean, we, were, we couldn't take students to the field. So students lost the opportunity for field research um, towards master's and doctoral dissertations because of that. Um, but the, the more interesting is the project that I now have going on in Brazil, which is actually where I did my dissertation work. Um, we have a, a new project there looking at how food and water insecurity are shaping the infant gut microbiome during the first two years of life. And um, 
that project is going on in the middle of a pandemic and the country doing second worst in the world is Brazil. So they're right behind us. Um, and that has been you know, an exercise in resilience and creativity and uh, all of those things because you cannot, I mean, so we, we basically had to create all the training videos for the entire team. Um, we made videos of them instead of me being in person and training them how to collect everything from fecal samples and breast milk samples to uh, doing ethnographic interviewing to doing systematic direct observations of infant activities, all of that kind of stuff. We did it all on videos and then zoomed it and then did Zoom training. Everything of course has to be in Portuguese. So we were you know going back and forth between languages um, and uh, then the field team has had to adapt. So we're like doing interviews over the phone instead of uh, going in person to houses because anthropologists work in houses. We don't like ask people to come to clinics and get measured, we go to your house. Um, and so we've had to like, you know, tailor some of that back and, and adapt that so that the team is not at risk of disease contraction, but then we're also not putting our participants at risk after all their new mothers with brand new babies. Um, so we've had to do all of those things. It's actually been pretty good, but this month we decided to shut down all recruitment and to cease data collection, um, except for focus groups, which we're conducting via Zoom or you know Google Meets or whatever, um, in order to, because Brazil's in a, what they is in their red zone, which means that they're in a semi lockdown. And then in, in Belém, which is the city where we're, where we're conducting the study, which is where the, where the Amazon dumps into the Atlantic ocean, um, that city is moving into what's called the black zone, which means they'll be on full on lockdown and people can only come out of their house for emergency reasons to buy food or to get medical care um, because their hospitals are so overwhelmed. So we've had to make a lot of, you know, we've had to be, and you know, that draws on the fact that I have 18 years of research experience to be able to think creatively about how we could do it. Um, but I am hoping that my students will be going to the field in the fall. Um, and that we are get vaccinated and we can do this, you know. We've had to adapt. So we have another question from the chat. Um, they asked Jenny and panelists, what's your favorite ice cream flavor? <laughs> I um I just, you know, I am really lucky. I like literally live in ice cream. And I don't know, I've never really been. I, sometimes I think I'm not, I've never really known how to do anything that I have done in my life, but I, I sometimes look back and think, you know what, somehow or another, I knew how to live from a very young age because I chose to be ice cream. So um, this is a question that I obviously get a lot and, uh, and I'm just constantly surrounded by ice cream. So, um, and eating ice cream all the time. Today, I ate our new um, collaboration flavor that we're not releasing yet, but it is mega and it's amazing um so wait for that one and probably my all-time favorite one is um probably our brown butter almond brittle which was inspired by the flavor that Roald Dahl grew up eating in Norway and he wrote about it when he was a grown-up and I made this flavor inspired by his writing and I've been told that it's very authentic by Norwegians and also please don't feel that like you have to um say one of my flavors whenever I enter the room people always feel like they have to like use one of mine but um, but I also love fish food by Ben and Jerry's. That's my Ben and Jerry's flavor. <laughs> so I'll start that. <laughs> well, I'll go ahead and say that if I'm going to eat ice cream in Columbus, Ohio, then I'm not going to Grater. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay. laughs> Maybe in even Cincinnati. Though, even though Grater's is okay. Um, I do like Jenny's ice cream. And I'm going to screw up the name because you don't always have it. But I like that bar nuts flavor. Oh, Yazoo Sue. Yes, that was, um, Yazoo's a brewery in Nashville. Yes, and because I like that wonderful. salty sweet combo. So I like that. And of course the brown butter, I do enjoy. That is a very, I get, that's a standard, but I love that bar nut one. And then, um, yeah, I think that that one's my favorite. I think that one's my favorite. Awesome. When are you going to make that again? <laughs> oh, we, you're the second person to ask like within the last week or two. So I don't know. Maybe it's going to make it come back. My husband likes the whiskey pecan. Oh yeah. I guess, I guess it makes it sound like we're both drunks and we're not. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is what you eat instead, right? Miss <laughs> uh, Jenny, I, I did want to ask, was Graders, uh, when you said Graders was your first, were you were the first employee there? Mm -hmm. Were 
was that your inspiration for get you know becoming an ice cream maker you know just uh or was that already there and that's what took you to graders well, yeah, it was um, when my when I was 10 years old, I was running by my grandmother. She was stirring a pot in her kitchen. And I remember she she stopped me in my tracks and she said she must have been thinking about her life. And she said, Jenny, you are so lucky. You can be anything that you want to be. It wasn't like that for me. It wasn't like that in my generation. And, you know, I was 10 years old and I, I was like, great, that's awesome. You know, I was taking it all for granted. It was the 80s, whatever. So I just darted out the door. And um, I remember when my bare feet hit the grass running out of the door from her kitchen to the backyard, thinking, oh, well, if that's, the, if I can be anything I want to, I'm not going to be a doctor or a lawyer or whatever she said, oh I'll be an ice cream maker. <laughs> so um, I, I knew that I really wanted my first job to be in an ice cream shop. And it just happened that they uh, opened in Columbus during the year of my 15th, my 15th year. So I could get a business or a, a work permit That's and go great. work for them. So I pounded That's on the great. door and I got that job. Um, but yeah, I, I really loved working there a lot. I, I really found myself. I mean, I was a very um, socially awkward, uh, very quiet introvert. Um, and I found my voice through service. Mm -hmm. And that remains for me today. Mm -hmm. thank, um, thank you for sharing. Minister Aaron and Antoinette, before we get to the last question, do you have a favorite ice cream flavor? I'm not really an ice cream eater. <laughs> I don't know. Um, and so, you know, and I'm, I'm just old fashioned. I like banana ice cream. You know, it's hard to find, but I love, I love banana, you know, and if I can mix it up, banana, strawberry, uh, we used to, we grew up making homemade ice cream on the back porch and, it was the old hand. It wasn't electric. It was the old one that you crank. And my mom used to make me banana strawberry ice cream. And so uh, it's always stuck with me. Uh, heavy cream. And oh, it, and so I remember I heard Miss Jenny speaking about that temperature of the ice cream and it being at the right temperature and it would just melt in your mouth and so creamy and delicious. Look, I'm gonna have everybody ready for some ice cream. <laughs> You're gonna be making some banana ice cream this weekend. I I sense it. Hey, oh, if you need a recipe, uh, let me yeah. know. Yeah. I'll yeah. send you a, I'll send you a recipe if you if you've got an ice cream machine. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So this is gonna be our last question before we do the giveaways. Um it's for Jenny. So Tony asked, she's from Michigan, I believe she said. Um, and she said, have you tailored flavors to the different areas where your shops are located, kind of like how different cities or states have their own specialty dishes? Yeah, we have. Um, and actually what has happened is that the other cities get really jealous of those. So a lot of times, which is actually how the Yazoo Sioux started out, it was a Nashville flavor. Um, and, and what's really fun is to make it a flavor inspired by another city or some history of a city or um, whatever, and then, and then make it available in other cities and tell that story. So it's just, you know, it's part of, I think what we do is, is just get inspired by people in different places who are doing cool things whether they're um, artists or, you know, people like Tyler, the creator or whatever, or growers or brewers, and, and then telling those stories as far and wide as we can. Every once in a while, we'll do a flavor like we did a banana pudding, a vegan banana pudding, which is stunning and it needs to be everywhere. Um, but we did it for Austin uh, when we opened there and it didn't show up everywhere, but I think it will be everywhere at some point because it's so good. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, thank you, Jenny, and our, and our panelists for, again, sharing your stories and for, um, you know, talking about what adaptation and resilience means to you in very different kinds of contexts. Um, as we had discussed before, in the restaurant industry, in terms of farming, in terms of research um, in Central Ohio um, and beyond. Um, so it looks like we've got um, 11 or 12 people that are officially um, able to receive one of our giveaways. That's pretty good odds for those who are here. Um, our only exclusion are for folks who are on our executive boards and our panelists unfortunately cannot win. Um, but I've got um, the list of everyone here. Um, I will say right now, I've got some family out in the audience here. So if one of them gets called out, I promise you I've randomized this list. Um, and so what I'm gonna have us do, um, we've got Jenny's poem. This is the, um, the first book that um, Jenny had written and won a James Beard Award. We've also got a $15 Jenny's gift card I'm a Southside Family Farms produce basket, and the hope will be that the winner will be someone local who can actually receive this gift basket. 
Um, and then a copy of Food Culture, Anthropology, Linguistics, and Food Studies. I'm super biased. It's an awesome book, um, but it's got an, a chapter written by Dr. Preparata. Um, and so we'll start, um, Jenny, if you wouldn't mind um, choosing a number between one and 12, and we'll see if that person has stuck around till the end here. I will choose seven, lucky seven. All right, is Nancy still here? Um, it looks like Nancy is the one person who had left. All right, um, so let's try a different number. Nine. Nine is Shane Skaggs. I think I saw him still on the list here. Shane, can you quickly? Uh... Hello, I'm here. Oh, yay. <laughs> Excellent. Winner. <laughs> All right, Shane. Thanks, so thanks for sharing, everyone, by the way. It was great listening. OK, now you have to make ice cream. All right, so this book is, ma I made it so I created it so you can create your own flavors not just my flavors. So you can mix and match and, and it's really fun, so. All right, excellent. Hey. Um, I'll ask um, Antoinette to choose um, one through 12, not seven or nine um, for the $15 Jenny's gift card. And 10. All right, that's uh, Karen Herrera out in Texas, my mother-in-law. So <laughs> congratulations, Karen, I think you're still here. Uh, let me just double check and confirm. All right, there she is. All right, um, so congratulations there, and we'll get that out to you. Um, Ms. Heron, if you can choose a remaining number for the produce basket. Uh, oh, did you say me? Yep. Oh, um, a number mm, four. Four, um, Emily Wolf, I think you were still here. Um, hmm. I do not see Emily. Okay, I guess she had left early as well. Can you choose a different number, please? Oh, uh, let's see. Uh, did they say nine? Mm, three. Three. Um, Tony Rose Arsenio, that's my sister, and I told you I, I got family here. Um, <laughs> we'll try and work out a way that she can get some Ohio produce. Um, and then, um, Dr. Preparat, if you can choose a remaining number uh, for the food culture book. Um, I'll go ahead and choose the last number, 12. 12. Um, Vinayak, are you, you're still here. Vinayak Shadikar, um, he's technically a panelist for our next um, series, so he's eligible for this particular win. So Vinayak, um, congratulations on that. That's what I was wondering about. If, if, if I am not the winner, I would be okay with that too. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll count it good. We're running out of numbers at this point. All right, well, I appreciate it. And thank you all the speakers, So It was great to hear everyone. All right, uh, so thank you all for, again, joining us um, tonight for sticking around um, this late. Uh, I've got the QR code for our participant feedback for um, this particular event. And if you've got some time, just um, you know, point your camera at this QR code or I'll be um, sending out a follow-up um, survey um, in your email. Um, and again, um, you can check out um, Vinayak and the others who are going to be joining us for our final event on April 13th. Um, we've got representatives from Tulip Cafe and Momogar as well. And so it's going to be a wonderful um, conclusion to our, to our series. Mm -hmm.